one another when we are distancing ourselves socially. Um, compared, to, compared to many of the other countries that we are in touch with, we in Sweden are quite uh, well. Our our freedom to move has not been limited. Uh, however, we're however we're practicing social distancing here as well, and and the Hunger Project Sweden office has been working uh, remotely since mid March, uh, just to also contribute to not being a part of, of spreading the virus further. So we have come together here today to, to hear a bit more about how the Hunger Project is tackling this crisis on both on the country level but also in the grassroots communities where we work. And some of you on this call have, have yourselves been to Ghana and seen the work on the ground. Uh, others of you have also visited other program countries so I think the majority on this call is quite well familiar with the context of the Hunger Project. Um, however, uh, I would like to introduce Samuel to the ones of you who don't know him in person. Uh, Samuel is our country director uh, for the Hunger Project in Ghana, and he has been so since 2013. Uh, and he has extensive background in working with poverty reduction across the country, I would say, but uh, much time was spent up in the north uh, of Ghana in a, in a big program to, to evaluate the, the work done to eliminate poverty in, in rural communities. Um, so Samuel, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, I know we spoke briefly before, you have just been able to to move. You have also worked remotely for some time, but today you're actually in the office. Uh, so thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, so I, I think just to start off the conversation, um, the Hunger Project has worked in Ghana since 1996, uh, mobilized 45 epicenters, reaching around 500 villages and 350,000 people. Could you tell us a bit about the context in Ghana both at the national level, how it looks like, but also how it looks like in our communities as of now. Thank you very much, Marlene. Um, like you said, we are not in normal times. The COVID has more or less unsettled so many things within our social and economic settings both as a nation or globally as a nation and then in communities and within households. Um, Ghana recorded our first case in my, uh, on March 12th. They were just two, but within two weeks, these, there, has been, there were some increases. And so, the picture of this, uh, the COVID-19 spreading in Ghana was so rapid from the beginning, and then it, it came from travelers from outside, both can Ghanaians and foreigners coming in. Um, but once they got into the society, then the, the people within the society started catching it. So as I speak now, we have 5,400 cases on hand nationally. Because of the severity of the increase, there was the need for government to take very drastic measures you know, to uh, safeguard the spread of the COVID uh, menace. And so three major cities which were identified to be hotspots were locked down. That was Accra. And in fact, when you look at the 5,400 cases that we have on hand, Accra on alone has 4,500, leaving only 900 for all other cities, you know, that also have the COVID cases. And uh, the three cities were therefore locked down, you know, to try to safeguard the whole country. And the lockdown was for three weeks. 
so that good measures could be put in place before other subsequent uh, decisions could be taken. Right now, as I speak, the lockdowns have been lifted. And so people are free to move about. But then uh, people only move about when it is absolutely necessary for them to move. And so most people are advised to stay at home and to work from home because the disease is still prevalent within the society. I must say that when it started, one of the things that we observed was that immediately it started all the physical protective equipment that were necessary to be used got, you know, finished within the society. In other words, uh, face masks that were available in the uh, uh, pharmaceutical establishment, they got finished. Sanitizers also got finished. And so many other things. So people were not getting, getting it. And so prices started shooting up. And so we as an organization, THP, we needed to take certain measures such that our people in the epicenter communities will be protected. And then we'll also have access to very uh, items that were needed for them to also protect themselves. So that was how the whole picture started. And now uh, the hunger project and our partners in the communities are fully uh, involved in protecting themselves and also working against all other things that we know from the COVID pandemic would become problems both now and then in subsequent periods ahead. Uh, people are taking precaution and also doing things such that we will not be caught on our ways. So that is the situation now, and that is what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what we have seen throughout this pandemic is how the information uh, about the virus, also the knowledge about the spread, is rapidly changing. Uh, and we also know that the information is not accessible to everyone. So could you tell us a bit about how the Hunger Project in Ghana ensures this information reaches our community partners, so they also have access to, to relevant and up-to-date information. Right, what we do is that, you know, the Hunger Project as forming part of the international NGO, you know, we make sure that, that we coordinate with the National Steering Committee for the COVID no pandemic. And so we get latest information from that platform. And then also, uh, the government has established, has a, 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 a established a, a, a medium that also provides us with adequate information through collaborative efforts with the UNICEF and then the World Health Organization office in Ghana. So we always get latest information that the Ghana Health Service and the Ministry of Health also has a platform that provides the nation with up-to-date information, especially on information that are changing within the world horizon. Beside that too, every week on a weekly basis, the government of Ghana also provides up-to-date information on the COVID pandemic nationally and then globally. So when you tune in to that on the TV, you get all the latest information and then the changing you know, issues within the, the, the COVID. So once we as an organization get this information, we also make sure that we give the information to our EPOs who are close to our partners within the communities. So the EPOs, through uh, information dissemination on FM radios, are able to get the information to our people on the grassroots. And then also, we have community, community information systems. And these are uh, systems that are established 
within communities in our epicenters. And it involves loudspeakers planted at various places to get information to the people in their homes. So from a central point within the community, uh, this information system carry whatever information we want to get to our people. And it covers very large area as well. We also employ the use of phones, you know, to try to communicate to our animators on the ground so that they are not cut off from the latest information that is needed. We also use posters and then handbells, you know, to send information to our people. So this is the way we get information across to our people on the ground so that they will not be lost out. Because some of the information they hear on the radio might not be correct information. So we try to give them this information so that they will be abreast with each current issues. That is what we do. And this is constantly done. You know, we do it very, very Tim, ser du om Samuel ramlade ur samtalet? Nej, han, han har inte trillat ur, men eh, det har fryst. Aj, aj, aj. Eh, nu till han nu. Eller? Jo. Hello. Där yes. yes. Yeah, there was a disconnection. Sorry. Thank you, Samuel. So, um, I know that besides from from doing this very important work of of making sure the right and updated information reaches the community partners. Um, I have also seen uh, myself some photos or heard stories about how the creativity also flows within the communities. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the saying that uh, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So exactly. could you share with us uh, some of the uh, inventions that our community partners uh, are now doing in order to, to, spread, uh, to stop the spread uh, of the virus? Right, thank you very much. Like I rightly said, you know, when this, thing, this pandemic started, almost all the PPEs, that is the, the personal protective equipment, almost got finished within the national setting, that is the commercial setting. You can't get it in the pharmacies. So we quickly rallied together to see the means of providing some of these things, possibly by the communities themselves. You know, in our epicenters, we have been able to open up vocational training centers. Boti, for instance, that is one of the Swedish-funded epicenters, has a vocational center. And this vocational center is operated by adolescent married girls, girls who married too early, and so were cut off from the educational system. So we managed to uh, mobilize these girls and open up this uh, vocational center so that they will learn uh, seamstressing, how to do sewing. So these people who have learned how to do sewing of dresses. So it was an opportunity for us to cause this establishment to sew uh, nose masks so that they will be able to provide the nose masks that are needed within their uh, communities. And that is the epicenter communities. So the pictures you saw indicated some of these vocational establishments that are sewing out nose masks based on standards that have been given out by the Ghana Health Service. That is, if they wanted to sew a nose mask, how they could go about it with local material such that the virus could not, you know, be caught from this. That is, it could protect people from catching the virus. 
So uh, nose masks are now uh, produced at the epicenter level. Besides that, we also taught through the EPOs, we also taught our community partners through these vocations that are established within the epicenters how to also produce liquid soap and even hand sanitizers. And so these things are being produced locally. So when they don't have, if there are no access in the cities, that is buying them from the cities, then they get access at their own local vicinities. So now the epicenters are produce these things locally, and so access is no longer a problem. I think I must also mention the fact that hand washing is also a key, you know, tool that is used against this uh, catching this virus. So what we also have done in this area is to teach the, our community partners how to produce this basic hand washing facility that we call tippy taps. And these tippy taps only use uh, ordinary gallons. So when they have uh, uh, plastic containers that are gallons, then they, 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 they put water into it and hang it you know, on, 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 on a piece of wood material that is available in their community. Then they tie a small rope to it. They bore a hole under it. And then with the pressing of, the, of, of, of a lever with, on the, with the foot, then the water begins to pour from the, uh, the gallon that is hung up there so that they get a water flow without touching a tap from there. And then with a, a detergent and with a water flow, they can quickly or easily and more conveniently wash their hands without necessarily touching anything there. So these are the innovations that these community members are providing by themselves. And these ones are done at household level. So the household can easily produce these uh, tippy taps and they have water flow within their community systems to do constant hand washing. They have their masks, they have their liquid water, uh, liquid soaps to do their hand washing, and they have uh, sanitizers that are also produced. So they are well equipped against the uh, pandemic. So that is what the community has been able to do through the little intervention that we have done with them. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, one of the core parts also of the epicenter strategy is the health clinics uh, that the Hunger Project mobilizes. Um, in Ghana, you have 45 health clinics uh, where you work in, in a partnership with the Ghana Health Service through an uh, established MOU. Could you tell us a bit about how this partnership is working during this crisis and how important you feel that it is to have this strong uh, collaboration with local um, authorities? Yeah, thank you very much. You know, this uh, fighting this pandemic is not about individuals. It is everybody's business. And more importantly, it is something that must not be, be seen as an individual and trying to uh, protect himself or herself. But whilst protecting yourself, you need to also protect the larger community. And so there are a lot of uh, collaborative efforts that we are also undertaking. You know, uh, through support from Sweden, we were able to procure uh, some appreciable uh, personal protective equipment made up of nose masks, uh, detergents, uh, tissue paper, sanitizers, uh, Veronica buckets that are needed, you know, for hand washing at the epicenter clinics. You know, this is very important because people certainly will come to the clinic with other ailments besides the COVID uh, virus. And so there is the need to protect these people and make sure that constant uh, health services 
or healthcare services continue to go on, not with, uh, in the, even in the face of this uh, COVID pandemic. And so uh, we are well linked up with the, the, our, the, the healthcare staff in our various epicenters, but all the 45 epicenters were supplied with these PPEs to first protect the health staff so that when they know they are conveniently protected, then they would have the zeal to provide health care to our people. Besides that one, we also have, uh, we, we, we have had some arrangements with the uh, regional health directory, especially at the Eastern region. That oversees 38 of our clinics. And so we, try, we, dis, we have discussed with them and we have a training program with this, uh, the regional health directory to train all our health staff in our epicenters, in our other ways, to make them COVID response, response ready, readiness, so that they become ready to be able to give the needed education to the people on the grassroots. And we are lucky, it is not just the clinics, but the clinics also have uh, nurses quarters attached to it. So our health staff with our various epicenters are staying with the people there. So they don't even have to commute, travel distances before they get to the people. They are right there with the people. And so we constantly hold uh, discussions with them, both on phone, and then they also contribute to even the education that we give on radios and then the community information systems. The health staff are always ready to provide the needed assistance and information for the people to, to be well equipped. So we have this collaborative air force that is going on at the national level, at the regional level, and then at community level, you know, having all stakeholders also on board, our animators, the health staff, and then THP staff also included. So that is how, that is the picture. Everybody is on board and we make sure that nobody is left out. And that is how we are handling it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I recently uh, read a report from the World Health Organization uh, that was looking at successful um, communication during health crises. And something that stood out was uh, the, needed to have, the need to have a trust in the local community, but also to have the local leadership. Um, you have mobilized uh, 350,000 people in Ghana, and you have also trained a lot of local leaders uh, that are working voluntarily as animators in their communities. Which role would you say that these volunteer leaders has played now during this crisis to enable you to, to actually reach out with this information? Thank you. What we do is that it is through these animators that most of the uh, locally produced materials that is training people to be able to produce these things locally and how to use them. Uh, the, the education on that is carried out to the people. A, a typical example is the use of tippy taps in washing hands how effectively people should wash their hands. So these are all education given through the animators. So the animators have become the first point, they get the first point training from THP staff and then the Ghana Health Service staff. And then they also, you know, they, they, they are respective communities. They move from community to community to try to set up a typical tippy tap you know, the use of a tippet taps in hand, hand washing. So they set up a base and then they demonstrate for the people to come and see. So these are things that are done within the vicinities of the communities. So a, 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 a group of people within the community, they come around and we make sure that they observe the social distancing so that they know that whatever things that we preach on radio, on the community announce systems, it's a practical thing in the community. 
So they make sure they do the social distancing while listening to the education programs that are being demonstrated. So they physically demonstrate how effective hand washing is done. And also, it is through these animators that we also put, uh, they put up some posters within some vantage points within the communities so that the community people will see. And then the posters contain some information, both in the local languages and then in English, so that they will see. So yes, these are our volunteers. At least we have not less than 20 in each IP center. And so these people carry out information to the various communities, apart from the fact that the APOs also visit the communities from time to time. But we have the uh, POs serving as constant or regular training front for the people within the communities. So we have it within the chain. So information gets right from us at head office through the, the uh, project offices, and then it's carried out through the um, animators, and it gets down to the people. So a lot of work is going on there. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Um, I think all of us here on this call is familiar with the, you know, the spread of, of sort of fake news or misinformation about the virus uh, coming from many different sources of, of media coverage or other. Um, could you give us an example of what kind of misinformation there is a risk to be spread in the local communities unless the right information is accessible? information and myths are going on within the system. One thing that came right from the very time we experienced this COVID you know, uh, virus was that uh, it, it, is not, it doesn't so much spread among Blacks. They said that the Black people have a higher immune system such that the COVID doesn't spread so much among the black. This is a myth. It is not true. And so uh, as quickly as the information came, then we also mobilized to try to counter it and make the people know that it is not true, that that is a human system. And if you allow yourself to be open up to this, you will catch it, whether you are black, you are white, you are red, or no matter what. It doesn't see colors. And so this thing was preached. And then there are also be, you know, local uh, medicine peddlers who produce some concoction and then uh, they, they, they cash in on that. There were examples that were some people who were even arrested by the police. They have some medicine, local medicine prepared and they said, this is uh, against the, uh, the COVID virus. If you take it, you will not catch. COVID virus, but it wasn't a proven or approved medicine, local medicine. So once these are found out, then we tell the people, this is the situation. We still don't have any cure for it. And so we are managing it. And, and that is what we give to the people. So all the wrong information, as soon as we get to know of them, then we also spread it out to the people so that when they hear about that, they can also tell others so that we don't get overwhelmed with the wrong information that is being sent out uh, within the social, uh, social systems. Because the, the, the social media is one of the medium that produces wrong information to the people. And so we try as much as possible to get the people to know about this and to be able to know where to check for correct information so that they are not easily overwhelmed. So that is what we are doing. And I think then also for the, for the community partners to trust then the information coming from you or from the Hunger Project, uh, it, it's really working because of the trust that has then been built up over the course of the years. Would you say that that is a factor that plays into role here? 
you know, being able to establish the credibility of one is, what one is doing is a key thing in getting trust from the people. Over the years, all the activities that we have carried out are known to be things that are proven to support the people. So the, the, the welfare of the people have always been built into the programs that we undertake. And then secondly, almost everything that we do, we make sure that the very people who benefit from these things are duly represented in whatever we do. And so their own people are part of the system that are done. And it is not just ordinary persons, but people who are trusted within their own social system, settings. People who are knowledgeable within their own social settings. People who are selfless and have the ability to volunteer to serve their people. And so because they see these people as people who are there for them, then they trust them and any information coming from these people, they know it is authentic because they are not the type who are only, who just want to take advantage of the people, but they are there to serve the people. And they see it, they observe it going on in everything that we do with the VCA, uh, the web education that we give them, and for child welfare activities that are done. When see, they have seen all these things, then when we give out information, they know it is a trusted source. And that when we tell them, wear your mask, then we are also seen to be wearing the mask. So when we are wearing it and we are telling them wear it, then it doesn't become something like you are carrying it for us to do and you are not doing it. We are in it. So when we ask them, they must do that to protect themselves. They know it is a reality. And that is the trust they have built in THP's activities. Thank you. Um, I know you yourself have uh, been out in some of the communities uh, to, to check on them during this crisis as mobility has allowed you to do. Uh, there's been restrictions, but I know that you have had the chance to do some visits. Uh, could you share with us some of the reflections that you have received from the community partners uh, or any testimonia from, from any of the partners you have met during this crisis? Yeah, like you rightly right said, even though there have been some restrictions, uh, we have had some, in fact, even during the restrictions, we were making efforts from the Ingo you know, perspective to try to get some ID cards that will allow a key members of THP to be able to move around because more or less we are also frontline workers within the whole uh, COVID response system because we give out information to a good number of population within our rural setting and that is recognized by our local government and even by the national government because we have as many as 45 clinics that are serving people in rural areas. So when we visit the site, some of the things that we try to uh, make sure they are established is how ready is our health facilities to respond to issues from the communities. That is one first thing that we do. One is the health staff protected enough to be able to give out information to the people out there. And so that was why we went there to see how the people, or, you know, the frontline workers, the health workers are enthusiastic about the support that THP is giving to enable them to serve the people. And I must say that the, the, the few PPEs, that is personal protective equipment that we provided to the clinics. Come and see how they were jubilating. Because they said, because Accra has 4,500 cases on hand, what government 
you know, equipment that the government is giving through the Ghana Health Service doesn't reach the rural areas. Because Accra forecast 4,500, we have 5,400 cases. So the concentration is on the hotspots. But we also think that protection or prevention is always better than curation. And so we want our epicenters to be protected enough so that if the, 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 the COVID virus doesn't even get to them, then that is better than getting it to them and then they fighting it. And so they had the initial protective you know, equipment and that gave them the confidence to be able to work with these people. And then too, uh, when the animators, when we visit and the animators see us, it builds up their confidence in what they are doing. And people see that, yes, what they are doing is very important. I remember a particular epicenter that I visited. Then the animator that came that if the country director himself has come to tell us about this thing, then the thing must be real, really serious. And so their outlook, how their response to the whole thing, it re-energizes them and gives them more confidence to be able to take up the work down there. So the little, the few visits that we had with, to them actually built up their confidence to be able to reach out to many people out there. It's always good that we work in a chain. Obviously, we can't take up the work down there from Accra. But when we, the, the few visits re-energized them and gave them the confidence to also reach out to the people at the grassroots. So that is the little bit that we are also, that we are also providing them from up here at country level. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Um, the, the community led efforts of development that the Hunger Project uh, is doing is really building that community resilience and also responsiveness uh, when, when crisis like this happens. Uh, one of the quite worrisome news that are coming now is that there is an anticipated increase in, in people living in chronic hunger in the years to come due to this crisis. Um, what, is your what are your reflections on that and how, what's your outlook on sort of looking into the future and how the, the hunger situation is affected by this pandemic? Right, thank you. Um... In fact, this COVID, the, this COVID situation has led to the, the increases of prices, of prices, food prices. Two items, food items, were even singled out by the government as the main factors that has increased the inflation, you know, the, the day-by-day uh, -day inflation within the economy from a single digit to double digits. It used to be 8%, but now it's 107 And they say that it is mainly due to increases in the price of foodstuffs. That has led to that. So which means that foodstuffs are getting scarce. Many people are stocking, buying to stock so that if there are no food and there is a lockdown, then people can get access to food. Incidentally too, this is the, fa the, the a farming season, the time that farmers must farm. And we have this COVID situation also on hand. Should we stop farming to protect ourselves or should farming still continue? And so we needed to take decision on that and support our farmers so that they don't unnecessarily become so afraid that they, 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 they refuse to do their farming. So one, we made sure that the, the microfinance within the epicenter system continue to uh, operate fully so that people who needed loans to be able to do their farming had access to loans. So the, the bookkeepers and the bank managers were equipped enough to protect themselves. And they also had hand washing facilities at every bank with sanitizers, 
and then detergent. So anybody coming there had the confidence to visit there without catching or without exposing themselves to the virus menace. And then the bookkeepers and managers were also protected with face, uh, nose mask to guide them so that they also had the confidence to provide the services to the people. So people still continue to have access to funds for farming. And so they are doing the farming activities and we still encourage them. And then too, uh, we also gave out education said that, you know, normally uh, when the, the farming season starts, that is that because farmers know that they are going to produce in normal times, what they do is that they sell out whatever produce they have in stock, especially maize. They sell out the old stock, knowing that the new stock is, will soon come to replace the old stock. So now we have given out education to them to tell them that, look, we are not in normal times. So don't sell out everything. You can sell half of your stock, leave out half, at least as, as a buffer towards the possibility of any hunger situation coming up. So they are still keeping some stock of the old food that they, they, they have in, in, in their storage. Beside that, farming is also going on as normal as possible because they have access to loans. And then uh, because of, we have agro input facilities also as part of our social uh, enterprises established at the epicenters, they get access to inputs also to do their farming. So our farmers and the education that we give concerning farming is still being given out to our farmers so that through the, uh, the, the COVID virus menace, they don't easily become so afraid that they cut their farming activities. No, they are still continuing as normal as possible in their farming activities because they are protected. In fact, I should give this example. When we were doing some radio uh, education in one of the epicenters, a cinema to be precise, as the education was going on, there were some farmers in the farms that had to come to the community to try to ask some questions because they heard those things even from their farms and they needed to ask some questions. So those people ran from the farm, came home to the communi communication center to ask the needed questions before they went back. So it means that there's real collaboration, education going on as they also continue with their farming activities and we give them the necessary input that they need. And then as a precautionary measure, we have also given them education such that they don't dispose of all the food stock that they have, but they leave out some food within their storage system and then continue their farming. So when they restock it and they know they have enough, then they give out because charity begins at home. You don't need to uh, uh, give out everything that you have. If you are, your new farming doesn't do well, then you, you, you put yourself in undue danger. So they are keeping some stock for themselves and then going on their normal farming activities. So this is what we are doing to make sure that we don't expose our people to severe hunger. And I believe that uh, with God on our side and when we have the good rains, luckily this year the rains are also good. We don't anticipate having any problem with drought. So we have good rains to do the farming. So with education and support with inputs, they are going on with their normal production activities. We don't anticipate any form of food shortages in our system. We would be able to even sell to people in the cities. That's what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Um, I assume another important factor is also the work that you're doing around the, the added value to the crops the value chain of the crops, uh, the cassava root, for example, that the Hunger Project has trained on how to, to, to dry and grain and, and be able to put into gari. 
which then can be made uh, to for supplies later on. So it's a way of, of um, conservation, I would say, a conservation method, uh, drying the crops, uh, which is also very important for the food security aspect. Um, I think to be mindful of time, um, Oh, I think Samuel is saying that. Sorry, Samuel. I'm saying that the storage, we, we, we add it up with some store education on storage so that uh, they will reduce, you know, uh, out of farm losses so that they are able to st uh, store the food and keep them for the time that they will certainly need. So we are putting a lot of measures. Not only that, they are also fortifying those that produce Gary. They are also fortifying with some important uh, nutrition that is needed for the body because people need zinc, vitamin C, and certain things to boost their immune system. So these things are these are education that are given to them so that when they are producing their gari, then they 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 make sure that they fortify them with some of these uh, important nutrition so that by eating the gari then you'll be building your immune system as well. So it's a mixture of this education just to make sure our people build themselves up to be able to fight the COVID, the, the COVID, uh, the COVID, the COVID menace that, is, mm. that we are confronted with. Thank you. Uh, I think also to be a bit mindful of time, uh, I would like also to open up the floor if anyone have a question to Samuel. Um, the ones of you who have a camera on can just simply wave. <laughs> and uh, for, for, the, for the rest of you, there is this function where you can actually raise your hand uh, if you can find it. <laughs> Otherwise, unmute yourselves. That's also fine. Do we have any questions? Niklas, thank you. I can ask uh, a question for you, Samuel. I hope you hear me well. Um, yes. Um, there's a lot of um, things done and, and I'm curious if you already now see any positive effect on the Ghana society overall uh, that you think that this uh, pandemic can, can cause because of this crea creativity. Is there some sec sectors that will develop faster because of this? Do you see any sort of uh, signs that there will be a good outcomes of, of this situation that is now very bad? Yes, indeed. Uh, it is not all bad, even though uh, largely we know that the COVID has brought so many things that uh, uh, we did not anticipate. And so there's more activities that we are doing. But there are also some positive sides. I must say that our societies are becoming more digital than before. Previously, you know, it, 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 is, it was so common that every, most everything that we, do, we were doing was face-to-face. -face. Visiting sites, meeting with large groups to hold discussions and trainings and things like that. But now, a lot of the things that we do are becoming more digital. Information is sent on, uh, uh, on, 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 on people's handsets to them. We communicate a lot through phones. We also do so many things through information systems. And so these are, even though they are uh, systems that we are doing in response to the COVID situation, but most of these things are still going to stay with us because we see them, we were not doing them, but now they, are, they have become more very important. And we also observe the quicker nature where the information gets to the people rather than traveling to get to the people. So information systems have changed and they are going to stay with us because we find out that they are, the outreach is better rather than going to meet people. When you send information through this current means that we are using, it reaches a lot more people and it is also something that I must say the youth are also more interested in these things because when you use digital means to send information around, then you get the interest of the youth also into the systems that we do instead of the face-to-face -face meetings that we used to have. 
because our animators are growing. The young must come to replace them. So whilst we use this dig digital means, it generates interest in the youth, in the activities that we do, and we, I believe strongly that the youth will be more involved in the things that we do subsequently. And that can be attributed to some of the changes that are now coming up. Thank you, Samuel. That's really interesting to hear because I know it's it's something that you have prioritized uh, for a long time, trying to engage uh, youth yes. more in the work uh, yes. at the local level. Uh, do we have any any more questions for Samuel? Tim, is there any questions in the chat box? <laughs> okay. No. Uh, I can ask a question. Yes, uh, it would just be interesting to hear uh, how you look at your role uh, as a leader now uh, within this situation because many times um, when you are the leader of the organization uh, you come to a situation where you need to engage the colleagues uh, and also reach out to the community and how you think of that uh, more personally maybe and how you look at the situation, how you can step up as a leader, or how you how you see it that, uh, on the situation in in your in your role as a leader. Yeah, uh, indeed. Uh, when a situation like that, like this, comes on hand, then it is this that actually calls on you as a leader to be able to show your your leadership skills. When things are normal you know, you do things normally. But when things become abnormal, like we have now, then it is for you to stretch yourself a little more further, to try to bring in certain things that will involve the rest. So now what we, I do, for instance, as a leader is that there is constant communication between myself and my other leaders. There are some who are leading the work of uh, the, her choice projects on, the, on site. There are some also the finance department, the m &E department, the uh, project officers who are also working on the field. To what extent do I get in information to these people very constantly, such that there must be information arrangement that are done constantly, so that information flow has been from me. Through the digital system, we have this uh, conference and to share information with the people. So it's done. So what I would say is that just like this, as a leader, then there is more the need for teamwork. Not just the leader doing things, no, but the leader operating through the other agents who are also there. The call for that is more now than ever. So teamwork has become more useful than ever. And then the fact that they also ought to create other teams down there and make sure that all players along the line become very, very important now and that everybody is seen to be very important and are made to operate and play their roles within the system. So when role playing is well done, Yeah, I think we have some internet. And from down, also to have more effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Unfortunately, it was breaking up a bit at the end. I think maybe there's um, some challenges with the connection. Oh, uh, sorry. It's fine. Um, do we have anyone else who wants to ask a final question be before we start to wrap up this uh, session? 
I think there's also if um, if if there is uh, unanswered questions or if you're curious to know more about what the Hunger Project are doing both in Ghana but globally, there is always the opportunity to reach out uh, personally to to one of us uh, in the team, and we will be happy to to update you accordingly. Samuel, uh, I would really like to thank you for taking the time. I know that you, as late as yesterday, were also a part of a global webinar. So you've been a very requested man as of lately. So thank you for, for taking the time to connect with us um, and really know that we are very happy to be partnering with you and to be part of, of the work that you're doing in Ghana. And I think it's also very valuable for us, both uh, as the Hunger Project in Sweden, but our investors and activists as well to know what's actually happening on the ground to be able to to communicate this to to a wider audience here in Sweden. So thank you very much Samuel and uh, please send our regards to the team to the family uh, and I hope that you will have a, a great Friday and and then a lovely weekend ahead. Yeah, thank you so much too. It's It's really exciting to also be part of such a program. I must say that we are very much thankful to our investors. We cherish them, all that they are doing, and we are ever ready to respond to anything that they think they want us to share with them. We are always ready to, to take that. We are never tired doing that because we believe that we all together are doing wonderful work in our communities down here. So I want to use this opportunity to also thank you all so much. It's been wonderful associating uh, uh, having things to do with you. We are so much delighted in that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you everyone for, for taking the time to join us for this webinar. Uh, Tim uh, has recorded it, so the for the ones who wants to relive it, or maybe share it with someone else, you can do that from uh, the link that, uh, maybe, will you put it out somewhere, Tim, or how will that work? Yeah, I will put it on our YouTube channel, and if you, uh, if you specifically want to see it, you can uh, email me at info at thehungerproject.se, and you can, I will send the link to you. And maybe I will put it, I can also put it, yeah, you who are in the Facebook event, I can put it in the Facebook event as well, so you can see it there. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Wish you a great weekend ahead. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hello. Bye-bye.